Integration Live q and I'm here with Alicia backman Bahari, my fearless co-pilot. I'm Mark Holfi. I'm located in Lethbridge and uh, Alicia is up in Calgary and we are delighted to be back with you this week. Lots to talk about. We're going to get to it in just a second. All right. So Alicia, how are things going up there in Calgary? Pretty good. Pretty good. Things are, things seem to be picking up. I think there's lots more of uh, an employment need that people are recognizing in Canada right now, depending on what sector. So that's ongoing. Absolutely. We've got a, uh, a bunch of things that we're rolling out. I know within the firm and some of the corporate work that we're doing, we've got some big projects and, and big LMIAs that we're doing and we're rolling out uh, um, uh, a bunch of things for that are geared towards employers and people that are looking at accessing the foreign worker program. Um, we've got some <clears throat> um, some email kind of campaigns that we're rolling out that provide information and tips and strategies. So watch for that, you guys. But one thing I want to start off with right from the very beginning, and I flip over here to uh, share my screen, is something I am unbelievably excited about, and it is our new Canadian Immigration Institute community group. This is completely free for everyone that is interested. You know, in the past, we've used Facebook groups and things like that, which I just, <clears throat> I just have not been terribly happy with. But now, finally, we have been able to, um, through one of our software providers that we use, Kajabi, um, benefit from this amazing new evolution for community groups. And so all you have to do, there's a link in the description below. Um, you can click to and request to join the community group. And inside here, we've got a ton of different things. There's, there's chat groups, there's discussion topics. Uh, we've got things organized based on the type of immigration application, um, an ability to connect with other immigrants. We even have um, groups for settlement after you've come and asking questions and sharing insight. And uh, obviously I'll be going live in this group. So if you're one of those individuals that's uh, wondering, man, I can never get my questions answered by Mark on YouTube. Well, I understand it's because there's YouTube, there's uh, LinkedIn, there's Twitter, there's Facebook, all these different avenues. And so I'm going to be definitely going live in here. And uh, obviously this is where we're going to post our, our, you know, as soon as we have our regular updates, breaking news and all those kinds of things we're going to build within this awesome community group. And so you can see here, we've got an express entry discussion. And the reason I have it as discussion versus say our study permit or spousal forums is because embedded within express entry, we are going to have separate subheadings or subgroups for specific topics like proof of funds, like reference letters, um, you know, like police clearance certificates. So watch for that. Um, like I said, weekly lives, we've got a chat room and we've also introduced our timeline tracker. So those of you, you love to share your success stories. So we'll be able to get a better idea of processing of applications. And, um, and so all you have to do is click on the link below in the description and you can get access to this community group. And uh, yeah, it's going to be just amazing. I'm so, so excited. Now, with all of this being said, Alicia, on the, the note of uh, processing times, I wanted to let everybody know that if you haven't seen it already, uh, IRCC in some aspects of immigration are really knocking it out of the park with how fast they're processing applications. And uh, Alicia, I, I filed a spousal sponsorship on December the 1st for some clients and they got their approval today. So oh, wow. less, less than two months. And that's obviously not, not something that we would expect. Um, but on the spousal side through the PR portal, yeah, less than two months for approval. So as far as the open work permit, well, it was almost not even worth doing. Um, then in addition to this, uh, I think I talked about this before you guys, I had a federal skilled worker client from Iran, which I was sure was going to be about a year, who also, she filed her application at the beginning of November and was also approved here in January. So we're seeing some crazy things. And then we've got some awful things, which are basically PR cards. When people have actually completed their landing, those are not being issued in a timely fashion. And it's causing huge disruptions. So personally for me, maybe slow down a little bit with the processing of a spousal and assign a few more officers to process PR cards for people because it's having huge ramifications and problems for them. So those are some of my uh, highlights, Alicia, and, and I'm hoping we can get some of our clients to come on, especially in the community group, to, uh, to share their insights and share their stories. 
Yeah, on that note, I, I had two success stories too. We had uh, two different applications. They were both under CEC and they got their draws last fall and then they were able to we were able to submit and they both contacted me this week and said I got my approval letters and so that's fantastic and and one of them she might she might join us Mark we'll, we'll see so she that said be, she might be open to joining us next week that would be so so fun so we love to hear like I said one of the things that we really really love is uh, is having individuals connect in and share their stories because there's so been so much negativity over the last, well, really all throughout the pandemic. It's just been just one negative thing after another. And, you know, I'll be honest, I've been kind of kind of cruel there, slagging the minister a little bit with some of the things that, uh, that he's been doing. But let's see if I can get this angle right here. But it's okay. You're doing all right, my friend. You're, you're, we're, we're seeing some positives, right? We're seeing some positives. All right, let's give some shout outs. Let's see who's in here. So we've got De Bottom over in Mississauga. Great to see you. Uh, Manzur, I'm doing fine. He says, hi, Mark and Alicia. Um, oh, we've got, oh, yes, yes. I always forget IRB Fox. I always forget what your first name is. Um, howdy, howdy, alumni here. Whoop, whoop. How tedious is the citizenship application versus PR? Citizenship is my next step. Thanks, guys. Yes. So, oh, what is, what is your name? Uh, I can't remember uh, what... Uh, what IRB Fox's name is. <laughs> well, the reality is citizenship is a little bit more tedious. Um, when they're issuing out uh, citizenship, they, they're much more particular, but it's also a little bit challenging with the online portal and they're doing some new things. And, and so, um, yeah, happy to help in any way for sure with that process as well. Okay, we've got Salim here. Hello to you. We've got Joseph. Uh, he says, hey, Mark, update for express entry draws. Probably next week, my friend. That's probably the case. Uh, let's see. Looks like we Alicia's kind of frozen a bit here. Maybe she'll come back. Tip. Let's see if we get her. Oh, there is. Now she's connected in. Um, your, your feed was just freezing up a little bit, Alicia. But we'll see if we can keep you going here. Okay, we'll give a few more shout outs. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, I love this. When can we join the community group? You can actually do it right now. And this is our MVP. So just like the government. So this is our minimal viable product. So remember when you're connecting in that um, like this is going to be building and growing. And at this stage, it's completely free. So we're not charging anything for it. There may reach a stage where we start to charge a little bit for it. But those of you who jump in and pile into the community group now, uh, there won't be any fee for, for being a part of the community group and having access to all of the other uh, uh, all of the other aspects of this. And in reality, the one thing, I guess the one and only thing that I would point out is that you have to give is an email address. And uh, so that we can reach out to you, we can let you know when we've got new, um, uh, new announcements and really in ways that we just can't through other social media channels. So we'll wait for Alicia to, to rejoin us here. She is uh, she's going through a little bit of issues with her um, uh, with her uh, her uh, her portal access here. So we'll see if we can connect her in in just a little bit. Okay, we'll keep going and uh, let's see. We'll give some more shout outs. Joyce, good to see you. And uh, and then we've got a, a person over on the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. Awesome and. That private Facebook group, this is the part that's really frustrating for me because we have over, I wonder if I can even uh, pull it up. I'm not even sure if I can. Uh, so the private Facebook group is Express Entry Law. Okay, so this is it. And I haven't, and I'll just share it over. I don't have, um, uh, let me just make sure I've got the right page here. And there we go. Okay, so this is the Express Entry. I'm not logged in, but when you search for it, this is the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. And um, in here, you can see we've got 122,000 members. But I'll be honest, when I go to post anything in the group, literally, it never ever gets to the actual uh, the actual people. And um, and it's just it's so frustrating to the point where I'm just like, we're gonna create our own. So thank you for joining in. Okay, let's see if we can pull Alicia back here. We're waiting to get her in. Okay, she's back. All right, we're good. We're doing some shout outs. So um, yes, so the private Facebook group that we had for Express Entry Law was the precursor. That's where all of this started. But now with our community group, now we have the ability to have all in one location, 
um, information and forums and a whole bunch of things like I talked about. For right now, we're just starting with express entry, study permits, and spousals, kind of the main the main, uh, the main section, but the, the weekly lives, I'll be doing exclusive live streams in here as well. Another reason why you'll want to join. And uh, it's just going to be so much fun. So, so awesome. And we'll see where it goes. We've got a bunch of, a bunch of cool things planned. Okay. Let's see who else. Uh, okay. Yeah. She says, that's true, Mark. I'm waiting for the PR card, but I'm sure that I, I'm within the processing time. It's almost one month. Yes, and the reality is when it comes to the processing times, there's been people, um, the processing times are, are crazy. And if we look at uh, PR card, let's see here. Uh, we'll pull up the processing times. I'll just slide over here and share with everybody. So when we go in here and we look at processing times, let's see where how bad it is for PR cards. So now remember, I just did a spouse common law partner one. And this is where the processing times, they're definitely under promising and over delivering. So if we've got a spouse inside Canada, you can see the processing times are listed at 13 months. So the one I submitted came back. And of course, it's because we did such an awesome job, but that's another discussion. Um, but less than two months literally is how long it took to get the approval. So things are, are moving forward positively. But if you open up permanent resident cards and then we click in here and, and say, I'm waiting for my first card, then you can see it says, oh, let's oh, you gotta get, get the processing, there you go. 180 days, like insane right? So, so this is, um, this is crazy to imagine that people would have to wait that long, but you know, just yesterday they updated it. So that's kind of where we're sitting. And, and personally, I think maybe they should slow down on some of the other ones so that, uh, and let's see, I'm, if she posted Brie, yes, Brie, <laughs> there we go, Brianna. So that Brie can get her permanent resident card in a reasonable period of time. And the reality is at this rate, um, when processing times for the overall application are taking less than, well, less than two months to have to wait over, you know, 180 days for a PR card is just crazy. Have you ever seen yeah, this before, I mean, Alicia? What, one of the things that the Canadian Bar Association has done is actually send submissions into the minister's office saying, here are our recommendations. When you have delayed PR cards like this, it's it's causing problems and it's causing people to potentially fall out of status because if they don't have that signed e-coper, then it can be a problem. So I know that sometimes like it, there's a there's a few steps that happen between when you get that initial email that approves your application, then you've got to wait for the access to your PR portal. You've got to fill that in once you, they've sent you the email link. And then once you get that application filed in the portal, then you've got to get your signed eCoper back and the PR card itself. And so what happens sometimes is that people fall out of status because they are not finally yep. landed yet. And that is causing a huge problem because your healthcare might expire. If you're an in-Canada applicant, you can't get a driver's license renewed. Sometimes your employers are saying, where's your authorization to work? And so the Canadian Bar Association has actually submitted this letter to the Minister of Immigration just this week. And one of the recommendations actually was to have automatic PR travel documents. Mm -hmm. So normally, if you're stuck in this in-between world and you actually do have to travel, then you'd have to go out and apply for a PR travel document from outside Canada. What the Canadian Bar Association is recommending to the minister is, look, like people shouldn't have to technically apply for this PR card as a separate process. There's only rare circumstances. So yes, they're doing it through this PR landing portal, but really we recommend, and this is what they say, that there's a EPR travel document basically that is issued mm -hmm. at the same time that you're finishing that portal so that people have the ability to travel in the meantime and then they don't also have to keep trying to tell their employer that they're legally authorized to work because they have a proof basically that they're already a PR and then they don't have to worry about their health care falling out they don't have to worry about not being able to have a driver's license anymore so these are important things for people so we do um, yeah. we're rooting for you we're trying to trying to get some movement there yeah, absolutely, Brie. All right, we've got Yagnesh says, hello, Mark and Alicia, hope you are well. Um, oh, yes, it's this is great. I'm so, so happy. David, thanks for connecting in. So, hey, David, we'll see. Maybe, maybe your application will get processed really, really fast as well. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. So thanks for checking in. Good to see you. Yes, you know, um, yeah, it was so great to have, have uh, David connect in and, you know, he's the first person in a long time that's actually came to my house. 
So uh, since I moved to a new office and he's, you know, that's what happens when you're near Lethbridge. Yeah, we do things in person too sometimes. So, okay, let's see here. Um, and Mark, I did, we, I did want to jump back when IRB Fox, when Bree was talking about that, and I see another question about Canadian citizenship applications. One of the things that makes it complex is proving every single day that you were inside and outside of Canada in your travel history and proving that you met the residency requirement as a, as a permanent resident. So one of the things is keeping a very good track of basically a travel journal and the government does provide you a template one that you can start to fill out as well. So make sure that every single exit and entry is properly recorded, that you're keeping track of how many days you were inside Canada and how many days you were in any other country to make sure that you're meeting that the three years within that five year period. So that's one tip is just keep track of all those all those entry and exits, because a lot of the times now when you go through the airport, they don't stamp your passport anymore. And so you've got to scramble to try to figure out what day did you actually enter? What day did you actually leave? Yes. All right. Here is a great question. So this one's from Ray. So Ray says, hey, Mark and Alicia, I hope you're doing well. Would you be able to confirm if the requirement of having a NOC 0AB job for postgrad work permit application for my spouse is no longer a requirement by January the 30th? Mm -hmm. And so this is just a brand new announcement and, and Mark's talked about it already a little bit, but we have yet to hear all the details on the program. IRCC has said that this new policy will be implemented by Monday, so we'll see how it rolls out. But basically the old rule was that in order for a spouse of a postgrad work permit holder to be able to get a work permit, an open work permit, you would have to prove that the principal applicant, the person on the PGWP, had a high skilled job. And of course, it's not NOC 0AB anymore. Now it's under tier, it's 0123. Um, so you can take a look at the changes over to tier. Yeah. So we do have the ability now not to have to prove that the principal applicant is in a high skilled position. So the nice thing is, is that you can actually do an application for an open work permit for a spouse, even if the principal applicant on the PGWP doesn't show that they're in a high skilled job. Yeah, exactly. So this is the notice that the, uh, the government sent out. And uh, yeah, so this is, it's good news. And you know, the phasing in of being able to get open work permits for dependent children. And, uh, and obviously this with not having uh, the, the open work permits linked to a specific skill level is a really, really big, huge development. At least you probably remember years ago when Alberta had their own uh, policy that granted open work permits to dependents of skilled workers in Canada and well in Alberta. And I think at the time, if I'm not if, if, if I'm correct, I think Alberta was 18, but Ontario was as low as 16. And then it all disappeared. But, uh, you know, it all unraveled when the economy and the global uh, crash, all of that happened. And Minister uh, Kenny at the time, you know, removed a lot of these, uh, these processes to, to obtain work permits for accompanying family members. And, and Mark, that's something to mention too. So the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program, which is now called the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program, so the AAIP, just announced last week that they are now waiting the presence of a family member, a close family member who's a permanent resident in Alberta. And they're also going to be putting new emphasis on certain occupations in demand. So this is a new announcement that just came out last week. And I wanted to highlight it because those of you who are sitting in, you know, the potential pool, you, you're looking at trying to have your express entry profile, hope, hoping for a nomination from a province and you want to live in Alberta. Um, if you do have a sibling, who is living in Alberta and you can prove that or if you do have the ability to show that your tier that your national occupation classification code is in one of those high demand occupations now the the kicker is they don't tell you what the high demand occupations are but we do have an inkling of what they can be based on the the labor and the wage surveys that we have in Alberta. And so I'll be I'll be writing a blog article to give people more detail and insights into yep. how this may may play out, but I just wanted to highlight it that 
you know, the provinces are starting to realize that they can start selecting people based on some factors that are going to lend an intention to reside in that province. And so it's a big pull factor to have a family member in the province. Absolutely. And it's the same reason that the federal government has instituted 15 extra points if you've got a sibling in Canada. So yeah. the provinces are definitely getting on board. Remember, as always, Alicia hinted at the blog. So our blog section here on our firm website, yes, we've got a ton of information all about what happens if things go south and uh, judicial reviews and reconsiderations and all these uh, writs of mandamus, things like that, that we can do. There's lots of information on that. But our blog post section on wholefeelaw.com is full of really, really good uh, tips and strategies and updates and news announcements. Uh, Chanel just wrote this blog post on how to increase your chance of studying in Canada in 2023. So we've got a lot of really good resources. Um, I'm in the process of reviewing right now as we speak um, a blog post that I'm going to be releasing. Uh, Igor helped me to put that together. That is based on, if we scroll back here, let's see if we can find, uh, and, and all of this is searchable to you guys. So the whole YouTube channel, if you're looking for information, you can search uh, the videos and everything on the site and, and, and literally find whatever you're looking for. But in here, in the videos, I did a, um, an update based on, and it's actually, I did a live stream that was on the government's very sneaky, okay, minister, I'm not going to pull you up and highlight it, but very sneaky approach to requesting, um, it's this one here, feedback on what the new uh, Express Entry 2.0 should look like. So we're gonna, I'm going to release a video that's, a, this one was long, like it was an hour and a half I spent breaking it down. But in the process of requesting for feedback, they actually released a lot of really, really good information on where they're thinking in terms of what they're going to do, the minister with these strategic draws. So, so watch for a video. We're going to have a video. And uh, as always, the blog post section here, like Alicia said, always go back, check this out. Make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter. And it's really easy. When you click on subscribe, then you'll get notifications when a new newsletter comes out. And uh, we always love to know who you are because then we try to send you stuff that only you want to see. We don't want to spam you with information that really doesn't apply. And we work with, with all different types of organizations, including municipalities, right, Alicia? Where we did yep. a, where we had a, a wonderful little seminar out in Claire's home, which is one of the RNIP selected communities, the only one in Alberta. And we did a, um, a nice presentation out there with, some of the liaison, the head immigration officers from Ottawa came all the way out to Clairsom. And that was a really, really good, uh, a good experience. And so even communities and municipalities were here to support them. So uh, yeah, it, this is, make sure if you haven't done that, do that. And then for those of you who are jumping in late, I want to emphasize once again, in the link in the description below is the ability to join our community group. And this will take some time to get all of you 45,000 people on uh, YouTube and the 123,000 on, on Facebook to slide over here, join our community group. And this is going to be an awesome place where there's going to be a lot of exclusive content, um, live Q and A's like this, um, you know, chat rooms, uh, discussion topics on express entry, study permits and spousals where we're starting, but they will expand and uh, our timeline trackers. So we're going to also release that. So those of you who are joining a little bit late, just go into the description below for this video, whether it's YouTube or wherever, and the link will be right there. You can also find it on our Canadian Immigration Institute uh, website page as well. All right, let's jump in and let's get to a few more questions. Um, okay, so here's one from AK. So AK says, uh, hi, Mark, how are you? I got a work permit extension refusal under the public policy launched in August of 2022. What can be done on that? This one breaks my heart, Alicia, especially given the fact I don't know if AK subscribed to my 18 month postgrad work permit course, which is now over. But this is one of our greatest fears is that people would do things wrong, get it refused in January, and then it's tough. So uh, aside from ringing the, the bell and saying book a consult, what are your thoughts on this, Alicia? We obviously don't know what the reasons or grounds were, but yeah, and I know I have a consult coming up very soon about a, a similar matter because 
there was a refusal on these open public policy work permits and it's really hard to give advice unless we understand why that refusal happened you know were you eligible for it in the first place what was it that caused them to refuse the application what's your status right now do you have any other options available to you is there a spouse that um, maybe is going to be able to slide over and become a principal applicant on on one type of application do you have an express entry application in the pool? Is it something where you can go home to your home country, gain some more foreign work experience and build up your points? It's really hard to say unless we're able to actually talk to you one-on-one, -on -one. bless you. So that's one thing to, to think about, but these are really tough because so far there is no announcement for another open public policy work permit. I think that ship may have sailed because the government is overwhelmed now and they're saying it's back to kind of processing as as usual there's not the same covid travel restrictions there are um, a covid travel restriction in place for for flights from asia but other than that things are generally kind of moving along in the world and so i think they are basically telling people it's it's up to you now to figure out what your next step is going to be if you are looking to transition to pr if you don't have the ability to have that open public policy work permit then you might be stuck in the world of going and finding an employer who might be willing to go do that labor market impact assessment for you. But that's always tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I just see here, uh, Lace says, can you share the link in here? And this is one of the challenges you guys is because, okay, let me see if I can do this. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll work on, she's asking about the link to the group, the community group. So I, uh, for those who are on YouTube, I'll go in there manually and I'll enter it in uh, uh, right now. So just hang there, uh, hang tight, Lays. Okay, let's. Um, uh, this is a good. Ex this is a good question, and uh, I'm afraid, Alicia, that we're going to see more and more people asking this. But I'm going to open this one up, uh, up and let you talk about this. So, are there any options for undocumented to obtain PR? So these are people that have overstayed or fallen out of status or otherwise. So maybe you have some insight for Eric. Yeah, and these are always super tough situations, Eric. I know historically, like way back when they did have a program, right? It was it was kind of like an amnesty program where the government decided that anybody who is here that could prove that they'd been here for a certain length of time that didn't have any criminal or you know um, inadmissibility concerns, they were eligible to apply for for a work permit. So far, that is not the case. Um, the government has been implementing new programs specifically for refugee claimants, mm -hmm. but you can't have been refused, right? You can't be somebody who's not gone through the process of properly filing a refugee claim, and then you are able to get your your work permit by filing the refugee claim. And there are some more pathways now that they're trying to promote for refugee permanent residents. Um, or if you're an overseas refugee trying to get permanent residence pathways if you're skilled in certain certain areas. But so far for undocumented applicants in Canada, there isn't any sort of amnesty program right now. Um, and it's a matter of trying to come back into the system, but there has to be some sort of pathway to be eligible for a temporary residence document. And as soon as you say, I've been undocumented for a number of years, then that officer is probably going to question your temporary. Right? So it is a tricky situation for sure. Yes. Okay, let's shift gears and let's go to this question from at Ravi. He says, do we need to provide new medical reports for permanent residents, even if we have an old medical report submitted during study permit? Yeah. And I don't know if you can quickly search for the new public policy notification on this, Mark, but the government did say in certain circumstances, certain people who had medical reports issued between this day and this day may not have to apply for a new medical report, but it, it really depends. Um, there we go. Look at that. Look I'm, how fast. I'm on Mark top is. of it. I'm on top of it. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, they implemented a temporary public policy to say in certain circumstances, people who have done a prior Im upfront immigration medical exam, if you've done it within the last five years and you're going to be doing a new TR application or a PR application from inside Canada, so this only applies if you're doing an inside Canada application, and you've completed that immigration medical exam within the last five years, and when you did that medical exam, you needed to have it 
cleared, that there was no kind of follow-up medical reporting requirements. So sometimes people have, you have to go do a chest x-ray. And then sometimes people have had a history of tuberculosis or something showing on the chest x-ray that you might have had TB in the past. And sometimes what they do then is they put you under medical surveillance. So if you have any of those complicating factors, this won't fly. This policy won't help you. You'll have to go do a new medical exam. But as long as you fit all the other requirements, it was in Canada, you've got one done within the last five years, you had no medical surveillance requirements, then I would say include a copy of that old e-medical information sheet, the one that has the barcode and your photo on it, and just tell immigration that you had done that in the past. So you can provide that as as a copy or a scan of a document when you're doing your PR application. However, that said, if you are at all concerned, you know, it might just be well well worth your effort and your time and the money to go get a new immigration medical um, so that that doesn't slow down the processing of your file if you're in a situation where you think it's iffy. All right. Okay, next question is uh, Yu Chi says, my post-grad work permit has expired on February the 20th, so it's not quite there, but it will be expiring. And I have received the ITA and submitted for the IEC Young Professional. Am I eligible to work after my permit gets expired while not yet receiving the approval? So this is a tricky one, Alicia, because the IEC is outside of Canada. And this is a great question. I'm going to give a little bit of an applause here because this is one that's super technical that, yeah, that people just don't get or understand. So do you want to address this? So many people get burned by this. Yeah. And so the trick is that the International Experience Canada categories are technically outside Canada categories. And so we're right at the time of the year where everybody's trying to get into these IEC pools. So most of the time, great, you had your profile submitted under the IEC, you hopefully met all the eligibility requirements. And then the government right now, IRCC is issuing these kind of nominations, I guess, under IEC, you get picked from the pool, and there's only a certain number of them, there's a quota, it depends on your country of nationality, and then you're invited to apply, and you only have a few days usually to apply for that, it's it's usually around 20 to 30 days before you have to submit your application. However, these are technically outside of Canada applications, and so the government expects you to be coming from the foreign country that you are a citizen of. So if you had an IEC, um, if you're a citizen of Ireland, you submitted the program through the IEC Ireland program, you would have to normally be coming from Ireland to be able to um, come in under that IEC approval letter and get your work permit at the port of entry. The problem with changing from a post-grad work permit, which is an in-Canada application, to a different type of outside Canada application is that there is an argument that these implied or maintained status provisions do not apply to you if you are changing from an in-Canada class to class of application where you would normally have to come in from outside of Canada. So be super careful about how you continue to work or not work after your post-grad work permit expires. So in most circumstances, you can't switch from inside Canada to an IEC, depending on what kind of category. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's jump to uh, a, a lighter question. So this one is from Mohammed. He says, do you think there will be a draw next Wednesday? What do you think, Alicia? I would hope so. I think they probably did two back to back because they were catching up. And then now I would hope that they're going to go back to business as usual with a draw every other Wednesday. So they had one last week and we're going to hope that they do one next week. Mm -hmm. And You can see we dropped down to 490. And so I know people are going to ask it anyways. So where do you think, Alicia? Where do you think it's going to settle? And yes, there's lots of people that, that uh, should have received ITAs that did not. And, you know, there's some kind of a glitch that's going on, obviously, in the system where people are being missed. Um, in some cases, like you're, you, you're specifically not to have two profiles in the, pool, in the pool at the same time. If you have a really, really high CRS score, then in some cases, I'm advising people to actually um, cancel their existing profile and recreate a new one, especially where the lock-in date is not going to be a big issue, just to make sure that you're not, you know, that the system doesn't think somehow or has not somehow skipped your profile or assumes that like just not taking it into consideration as an active profile. Um, some people will remember 
there were periods of time with the OINP where their system would uh, would initially, and this is years ago when Express Entry was launched, but sometimes the system, if you had a profile in the pool and they did one round of invitation and you weren't selected, then it wouldn't consider you again for other ones, even if they did a subsequent draw that was also in that slot of, of uh, CRS score that where you were, you know, because your profile was already in the pool. It's kind of complicated. They've kind of sorted through it, but um, that is one option if you haven't received it. But um, yeah, but I'll be honest, it's literally um, uh, immigration just doesn't really care about this. I'll be honest. They're not, they, you know, unless there's some miracle that happens, uh, if you've got a profile that that was passed over and wasn't drawn for whatever reason, and it was a really high score, so the lock-in date doesn't matter, you know, we are, you know, advising some people to consider resubmitting a new profile into the pool so that you're giving it a fresh look for the next draw. And if uh, with all of this stuff, you guys, we talk repeatedly. You can see, I'll just flip back here to our main um, to our main screen here. Just give me a second. So I'm moving around here. Um, all of this that we do here is sponsored by the Canadian um, Immigration Institute, but our law firm, Holthy Immigration Law, is where you can go to get the legal help that you need from us as immigration lawyers. So we're here to give you lots of tips and strategies, but if you slide over to our firm website, um, you can very easily find our consultation page where you can click on very easily, find a lawyer, click on the consultation. It's super easy uh, and um you know, we can get you in right away. And so Alicia's backlogged a little bit here and we've got some podcasts we're recording tomorrow, but Monday, right back at it. And so there's uh, lots of availability and and there's always going to be someone who can help you. And if you're wondering other people's experiences booking consults with the firm, well, just go to our Google reviews and you can see over the last basically year is how long we've been doing this. Um, you can see where the reviews are and uh, yeah. As I said before, if you've got a 5.0 rating, don't trust that company because no one has a five. Sometimes clients don't like to hear the advice that we give them, especially when they're trying to cheat or scam or misrepresent. And then when I tell them you can't do that and I won't have any part of it, sometimes they're not as friendly and will then put one star ratings. And that's totally fine because it keeps it real. All right, let's jump back to some more questions here. Uh, right next up. Okay, this is a little, this is also a little bit of a shift for us here, Alicia. This is from Justin. He says, um, hi, Mark and Alicia, just want uh, to ask about the caregiver program. Any new programs this year or is the child care provider program reset in terms of the number of applicants this year? Thank you for your answer. Oh, what a, this is one of the most dysfunctional programs in the history of immigration. It It really is. The saga of live-in caregivers to the home child care providers to there's three different types of pilot programs that <sighs> the tension is this Canadians really need caregivers they need caregivers for the elderly and for people with disabilities and they also need caregivers for their children and unfortunately they're this is an area that's kind of ripe for abuse, right? Where you have people from overseas who are working in somebody's house and they don't often have a lot of protection and they don't really know their rights. And so the government recognizes that and they have tried to make that program more transparent and to have more kind of inspections where they're following up with the employers to make sure they're doing it properly. They're not holding people's passports. They're not putting them in living conditions that are unsafe and they're not making it a requirement for a live-in component in most cases. However, basically they've shut down the tap, right? They've said that unless you're already in Canada in most circumstances, you can't apply for these programs that are gonna transition you to PR. They have been trying to fix it in that if there's upfront medical inadmissibility or criminal inadmissibility for the principal applicant or their family members, they're trying to screen for that first so that you don't have a caregiver that's been working here for years before they find out they're inadmissible. So they were trying to switch to this home child care provider program to do all the screening up front, to give people the ability to have work permits in that specific NOC, but not tied to a specific employer. So they were trying to change the program. But what has happened is processing has not moved forward. Yeah. And so there was a quota for each of those. So there's a quota for the home childcare provider and there's a quota for um, 
the people with disabilities or elderly. And so those two quotas are supposed to refresh at the end of every year. Sometimes they just don't post the updated statistics on processing, but we know anecdotally from other immigration lawyers who have had files sitting for months and months and months that these are simply not being processed quickly at all. So it is tricky. We have not heard of new programs. What we have heard and what is a positive development is a lot of the provinces are really trying to move forward with programs for medical providers. And so that's healthcare of all different sorts. So if you take a look in Alberta, for example, the Alberta government actually signed a memorandum of an agreement or a memorandum of understanding with the Philippines to try to bring in Philippine trained nurses to work in Alberta. I know that in BC, for example, there is a priority processing of certain occupations based on your knock in the healthcare provider areas. So there are provincial programs that are trying to fill in the gaps here, but it really does depend on the person's training and which knock they are claiming because if you're stuck in that in the child care provider specifically and you don't have an rn or lpn or anything else it is it is tricky yeah just a little a little flashback this here was the news report that uh, came out october the 11th where alberta <clears throat> where alberta and the philippines reached agreement to recruit more nurses to the province yeah and i better not i'm almost leery not to show uh, any, <laughs> excuse there me, is... any, uh, any pages even on our live stream because the news media actually um, sued me for having an image from one of the newspapers that I was promoting on one of my social media things. And I'm like, well, screw you guys then. So whenever I do interviews with the media now, the mainstream media, I sp specifically prohibit them from using any of my images or any of my video without express uh, permission from me because they'll take one from one news media and then they'll just share it all through the the press and um, I think it's a complete double standard but anyway sorry I'm off on a little tangent there I, I was just gonna say I think it's on the Alberta government website too that that yeah. MOU's up there yeah perfect okay all right let's go to the next one okay this is actually one um, that I probably wouldn't cover but it will lead to some other questions so Let's see here. Um, just give me one second. Right here. Okay. So this one says, what province is geologist in high demand? And we get a lot of questions now that, you know, the minister is going to be using more targeted draws and things like that, at least sometime in the spring. The, the reality is many people are wondering, well, what is the job market like in Canada for my position? And where we go for those kinds of uh, answers is, if I flip my screen around, is the job bank. So right here. So if we're going through here, you can actually look at the top to trend analysis. And in here, we can find outlooks. And then from here, we can scroll down and we can select the occupation. So if we want to take geologist here, we should be able to find it. And I think that's what we're looking for was a geologist, right? That, uh, that, uh, Yes, Africa Oracle, Africa Oracle, yeah, was wanting. So if we look here and then we click search, then they assign a star rating, you know, as to whether or not it's in demand. And this is kind of their methodology. It used to be, um, I guess it used to be a three star and now it's gone to a five star. And so obviously five star is very good. So, and, and you can see in most provinces, so Newfoundland and Labrador, it's good. We scroll down to, um, uh, to PEI, um, there isn't enough data. Nova Scotia, there isn't enough data. Uh, we, we go through New Brunswick, same thing. Keep going, Quebec, same thing. And you can see some, some communities have reports. So Ontario, it's good. Keep going down. Let's see what's next. Manitoba is good. Saskatchewan is good. So it looks to be, it looks to me like it's pretty good in most regions. Alberta is limited. So apparently there's not as many geoscientist opportunities in Alberta. And then we'll hit the final. Uh, British Columbia is moderate. So that's one indicator that you can use when you're trying to figure out what the job market is for certain occupations. You can go to the trend analysis on the job bank and click outlooks. Um, another thing we do a lot when we're helping employers is figuring out how much they have to pay people. 
And so with wages here, it will give you the prevailing wage rate for that occupation in certain regions. So if we search for geologist again, and we say for, um, for Newfoundland Labrador, you can see if someone wanted to hire you on an LMIA to work in Newfoundland, there's a little bit of variation here, but ultimately you're, you're looking at around $43.27 an hour because they have to pay the median rate. So just a little, a little bit of insight, but there you go. Um, hopefully that was helpful for you. Okay, let's see what we have next. Um, okay, Klaus says, are the draws of RNIP program relatively smaller? So Alicia, do you remember what they had said, what Brady had said in, in our meeting um, with how many they had each year? Yeah, so if you look at the RNIP overall, there's only like, I think it's 6,500 overall throughout all of the programs for all the communities that have signed up for RNIP. They said that 6,500 renews yearly, um, but it's it's a smaller number if you look kind of number-wise compared to other provinces. So those RNIP numbers are targeted at only the communities that are listed on, on the RNIP as a partner community. And each partner community has its own, okay, so maybe we're, maybe they've refreshed it now to 8,500. Well, this, to is, 6, this is, it encompasses, it looks, Alicia, like it encompasses agri-food, it encompasses, oh, the, you can see the economic mobility pathway, as well as the RNIP right here. So it's yeah. it's a combination. So I think you're you're accurate with, uh, with with total numbers, but yeah, for this year, eight thousand five hundred is what they are projecting as a target for twenty twenty three. Yeah. So if you go to the RNIP webpage itself, it has the six thousand five hundred figure on there as the total number, and that's distributed across all of the partner communities. And then each community normally applies for a certain number within that community that they can give out every year. And then if they have not used up all their allocations, then they can release those spots and give them to other communities that may need the nominations. Yeah, exactly. All right, I was just looking here to see. Um, but what did Brady say? How many did they, uh, has, has Claris Home issued? I think it was around think, 50 or something that they had a year and it's yeah. not definitely not large numbers close. And that's part of the problem. You've got all of these agents and, and, uh, and representatives, consultants and others, you know, even lawyers that are, you know, advertising, Hey, the RNIPs might be a pathway for you. And, uh, and the reality is they're really, really small numbers. So check with that specific community to see how many nomination spots they have. And Mark's right. Brady had said that for Claire's home, it was 50. Yeah. All right. Let's jump over here to Ibrian. And I'm not quite sure if I fully understand the question, but it says, can work experience documents for both partners be accepted if they have their own business in express entry? So I'm not quite sure. Um, I think maybe what they're trying to do is claim work experience from that company so that they can both apply independently through express entry. And I can't see any reason why not if, you know, the work experience is outside of Canada, it's not self-employed. Um, mm -hmm. um, I can't see any reason why they, why they wouldn't as long as they've done and met all the requirements uh, to claim foreign work experience. Yeah, keep in mind it's different if you're trying to claim Canadian work experience. You can't be self-employed and try to claim that as Canadian work experience points. But if it's an outside Canada employment situation where you have, you can prove that it's a business and you are properly doing the job duties for whichever knock you're claiming and back that up with contracts and proof, then you should hopefully be able to, to claim that. Now you're not going to get, if it's an outside Canada application, if it's FSW, you're not going to spouse under that unless you've got two separate profiles with the other spouse trying to claim as principal applicant. Okay, let's go to Jessica's question here. She's received the PNP nomination based on the NOC 2016. She received an ITA after the NOC update to 2021 version. Her question is, should I tailor the job duties to the 2021 version or stay as 2016 version for PR application? And this is the classic issue with IT world, NOC 2174 to uh, 21232. And, um, you know, I think generally speaking, uh, maybe I'll jump in here and give a little bit of thoughts, uh, Alicia. 
you're when it comes to tailoring, remember you guys, it isn't a matter of just putting in a letter whatever you think IRCC wants to see. The most important part is that the duties in your letter are consistent with what you actually did. So you never want to be in a situation where you're trying to misrepresent something. But with that being said, Jessica, this is a problem that many, many people are running into. And this is something that we help clients with all the time. And I would strongly, strongly uh, suggest that you uh, connect and, and book a consultation with Alicia to go through this. But ultimately, yes, there are things that you can do within your reference letter if your employer is you know, giving you, um, uh, at least allowing you to contribute and collaborate on that ultimate letter. There are things, and often I see where people have a, a job offer that lists a certain set of duties um, but in reality, when they were working for the company, their role expanded or they did more things. And so there's absolutely nothing wrong with trying to adjust your reference letter to make sure that it more closely matches the knock as long as you actually provided those duties. So yes, in the context of express entry, even if you were nominated through a PNP, you want to make sure that you are, if 2021 version is what you're aligned with, that you're going to make sure that your your duties align with the one that... Um, you know, that, that is the proper knock code for the work that you did. We know that 2174 and some of those other ones kind of split off. I can't remember if it was software developer into a number of different ones. And so the key is just make sure that you're based on your duties, that you're lined up properly. Any other yeah. insight, Alicia? Uh, Jessica, I've had, I think, two clients that are in exactly that same situation and we've worked through it, but it is tricky because it's a little bit of a minefield and when there was the new change to tier, I wrote an article too about, you know, things to watch out about with the switch over to the new tier. And this is exactly one of them because, because you got your invitation to apply after the deadline, after the rollover to 2021, technically that's what the officer is going to be assessing you against. However, because you have a nomination from before that time, you also need to show how it makes sense that you were nominated, especially if it was an employer supported nomination. So be really careful about these situations. I can't give you specific advice. I can only give you general information in, in this sort of format, but please book a consult because you wanna make sure to get this right. And you wanna make sure that there's no misrepresentation at all on this file. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. All right, so there we go. There's the blog post that Alicia drafted. Okay, we'll finish with one last one as our time is wrapping up. We'll go to, uh, to Lays here, and uh, this happens at times. So Lays says, what happens to the employee who had a valid job offer and claim points? So we don't know. We'll assume maybe International Mobility Program or LMIA and uh, had a layoff after submitting the documents to the ITA. So I'm assuming she means filing the EAPR. Do we have to withdraw or proceed with the process? So... This is a situation, Alicia, where you have someone who claimed job offer points and now have been laid off. Yeah. So, what would so you yeah, keep in mind, yeah, this requires a consult, but go read my article on can I claim CRS points for a job offer. So on the blog, I wrote an article about this. And if you look at the legislation, it is very specific about if you're claiming what's called arranged employment points under the regulations, then you have to fit a whole bunch of preconditions and then one of three scenarios. And it looks at the time that you have to meet all of those requirements. And most of it requires that you are employed all the way up at, until a decision being made on the application. So you have to be very careful that you're not misrepresenting and claiming points you're no longer entitled to if there has been a layoff. In some circumstances, it might be possible to get a new offer of employment from a new employer and try to save that application, but that might be super tricky. You've got so many blog posts here, Alicia, that I'm trying to find the right one. Was it in here? No, it it's um, job offer. Can I claim yeah. job offer Very yeah, good. points well, from my offer of employment? There we go. Anyways, it's there. It's in the blogs. And there's a link. Uh, I was able to post the some of the links to our discussions today in the YouTube feed. So go check that out. Um, but as always, remember, this this entire process, what we're doing here is is a way for Alicia and I to give back to answer questions to help you guys realize that if you're looking to hire someone, hire our firm, hire us to help you. And we have some really unique ways in which we do the work that we do in our firm. And if you go to our healthylaw.com website, which is in the link here, obviously 
Speaking to a lawyer is the process that starts everything with us. Booking a consult and then hiring us uh, to, to assist you with your immigration journey, your applications. But if you go to our About Us and check on our approach, you'll see that we do things differently. We have a direct lawyer to client collaboration. So there's no middle people. And one of my favorite things, and I wonder if I can still pull it up, was a comment that Alicia got in, in our reviews. Um, I'm just trying to remember who it was. I think it was Deborah, maybe. Um, yes. She says, as you look at Deborah's comment, that was just two days ago. I loved it. She said, one thing that I enjoyed working with her is the fact that you communicate directly with her without a person in between. And so many times, that's how lots of larger firms are established. You never actually talk with a lawyer, but we are 100% connected to you directly. And she said, the other advantage with the approach is that you go through your profile and documents in detail at least twice. Well, the reality is there's probably, in many cases, there's even more. But that's what we offer within our firm. So we hope that what we're doing here, that you will share this information, that you will subscribe to our channel, that you will like what we're doing. And stay tuned because Alicia and I are going to start to push out more podcast episodes on various topics. And the next one that I will be releasing is a podcast episode that I'm doing with CellPip. So CellPip, the language assessment, um, I have a, a scheduled meeting tomorrow to record that podcast with one of the um, head officials that uh, is going to offer insight and strategy on how to increase your scores when you're writing the CELPIP. And remember that CELPIP uh, testing stations are all over. So they're starting to grow internationally and not just in Canada. So watch for that and uh, a bunch of other things that we're going to be have uh, coming coming forward here. All right, I know Alicia and I both have consults and things we have to jump off to. It's 101 right now. But thanks for joining us, everybody. And uh, good luck as you navigate this crazy world that we call Canadian immigration.